see it signed out. Welcome to you this morning. I hope God has blessed you. Welcome to those on YouTube, Facebook, online. I don't think we have everybody in the parking lot today, but if you drive by, 1075, poof, then you get at least 30 seconds of a message. We're going to continue in our series in the book of Colossians, talking about the stability of your faith. That's the subtitle. How many of you are thankful this week? Yes, amen, me too. How many of you are thankful for your stable mind? Oh, yes. How many of you are thankful for somebody else's stable mind? We like those people with stable minds. What about their faith? What about their faith? You know, we continue to live in the shadow of the plague and the divisiveness of a nation. I don't know that we'll anytime soon get out of that. And so, to say and to wish and to hope, it just all goes away. Like, bury your head under the pillow or stick it in the sand and I'll bring it out and it'll be back to normal. I suppose not. I suppose not. And so, this morning, we're going to continue to deal with all of the struggles that we had yesterday. And perhaps even tomorrow, in the next day, and into the future. I don't say that in a way of diminishing you or uh, causing you, oh, heaviness, anything like that. No, no, no. Wrong thought. The steadfastness of the faith of the Christian in the church today is, I believe, with the power of the Holy Spirit, the only thing holding things together right now. The only thing in person that will hold it together in the days ahead. But, more and more, the true nature of faith is coming to the surface of our lives. Not only in the church, but around the nation. Certainly the country is displaying the nature of the fallen and corrupt mindset. Because that's what they do. I expect that from them. And they do not disappoint. That's the great thing. Uh, within the fallen nature of everything that we hear around us. Most of the talk is from a fallen nature. Most of the ph philosophy is from a fallen nature that we hear around us. But I want you to know that there's a still small voice speaking forth light into darkness. The voice of the Holy Spirit is still speaking forth truth every moment of every day especially in the life of a Christ follower. Truth is necessary for us to maintain and hold a steadfast faith. <clears throat> steadfast faith, is going to, as we're going to see today in the book of Colossians, is set, it is sure, it is, it is carved out, very much like a direction. Uh, <clears throat> very few people today do not know about old Betty. You all know her. She's the one that you're looking at the little box and she goes, turn left in 100 feet. Turn right in 100 feet onto such and such road. I love old Betty. That's what we call her. I love to mess with old Betty. So I just keep going when she says, turn right. Recalculating. Sometimes she says, turn around. Okay. She's constantly trying to keep me steadfast on the course. Because I know so much more than Betty does. It amazes me you can be in some small village somewhere around the countryside and she knows the names of the streets. I just, I don't know how that works. And I go, wow. And she even knows the distances. Your destination will be 100 yards on the right. How does she know that? I think, wow. And sometimes it actually is 100 yards on the right. Now, sometimes you're looking at a bare field and going, Betty, you're, you didn't make it today. But we need a steadfast course, someone to lead and guide and direct us. We used to have maps. It's this old archaic structure, paper, 
used to be able to get them almost anywhere. But you also then have to know how to read the map. It required at least some knowledge on the part of the user, like which end was up and which end was down, left, right, that kind of thing. That's what Paul is going to give us. He's going to give us a road map for the steadfastness of our faith. And we're going to join with that, and we're going to talk about some of the disciplines of the faith, and then we're going to add to those disciplines several bits of instruction from Paul, then from Peter, on the type of faith that remains steadfast. Paul is concerned, first and foremost, with the first century church, knowing that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is steadfast in that course. He also is aware of how easy it is to fall back into sinful patterns, and especially sinful patterns that they have just left. A new Christian, someone who's just come to Christ, pretty easy to fall back into old sinful patterns. Now that can happen with Christians who've been out a while. But in the first century, the formation of the church, they didn't have all this wise instruction that we have today on how to maintain a steadfast faith. Did you know that the enemy of God is always whispering in the ears of men and women, both those in the faith and those outside of the faith? He tells them not to listen to God and to listen to their own minds. He deceives them into thinking that they actually have a say in things. He deceives them into thinking that they actually are important to the decision makings of the world and that their decisions, their mind is the most important. And that's what we see. Now Paul expects and even commands those Christ followers to not listen to the enemy. To be able to tell the difference between the enemy's voice and God's voice. And man, some days that's tough. Some days that's very difficult. And he's going to address that. Paul expects that the commands of the Christ followers who make up the church have a true understanding of the ways of God. Hence we begin. Colossians chapter 2, if you would turn there. In the New Testament, about halfway through the New Testament, small book of Colossians. Chapter 2, verse 4. Paul speaking. I say this, and this is the NASB, so that no one will delude you with pervasive, persuasive arguments. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline in the stability of your faith in Christ. Paul rejoices in the stability of faith in a believer's life. And so he says there's an order to this. He says that what you have to know first is there, there is someone to delude you with a per, persuasive argument. How many of you have, don't answer this, <laughs> bought something from a salesperson, but you didn't intend to buy it? You were just looking, and suddenly you're the owner. And you go, how did that happen? And sometimes it's not just a screwdriver, it's a car. <laughs> wow, you won. And this was a problem. In fact, years ago, it was such a problem that the base, as far as out in the Airway Heights country, uh, the base commander put several establishments off limits because they were so per persuasive that young airmen were getting things that young airmen couldn't afford. And then they were falling into debt, debt which they couldn't get away from. And so the commander says, we're putting you people off limits. Oh man, did they straighten up their act? They quit trying to persuade the young airmen that they absolutely had to have this brand new shiny car or whatever it happened to be. You see, in the church today, we can be deluded. We can have a pattern of speech which beguiles us or entices us. If you turn down just to the right just a tiny bit into 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul addresses not only to the church in Colossians, but to leadership within the church 
in 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. People are persuaded to listen, and then they're persuaded to turn to a myth, to error, to lies. Why? Because Paul tells those in the church, you know, there's going to be a time coming. And I believe he felt that time was then. That's why he's talking to Timothy. Hey, get out there and understand that in the church there's going to be a time when they're not going to endure sound doctrine. They won't tolerate it very well. Sound teaching. And you'd say, well, how could there be a church, a church that follows Jesus Christ, that would not follow sound teaching? or sound doctrine. Doctrine that is whole. Doctrine that is right. Doctrine that is necessary. And there's many doctrines, a few, of the faith. We have a large, we have the small, what we believe handout here at the church. Just a little short one. And then we have the large, what we believe. And the whole articles of faith that we possess starts off with the doctrines of the faith that this church believes in. We have a doctrinal statement, and it's given out. And some people have found, no, I can't agree with that. And so their argument is not with us. We didn't just sit down one day and say, hey, let's come up with some doctrines. Some religious groups have done that. We say, what does the Bible teach, doctrine, teaching, what's the group of teachings about God? about Jesus Christ, about the Holy Spirit of God, about the Bible itself, about salvation, about the church, and on it goes. And it's not our opinion, it's what the scriptures say. And so there comes a time when people will not put up with the sound, correct, truthful teaching of the scriptures. And I think we could say today, we're here. We're here. Sometimes even in the church, and that saddens me the most. Saddens me the most. When a church, a body who says they are the body of Christ, refuses the teachings of Christ. How can that be? It should not be. Well, it is because they want to have their ears tickled. This sometimes flies in the face of what some have called user-friendly churches where everyone is welcome in the church, no matter what your belief, what your stand is, you're welcome. And certainly, all you sinners, you're welcome to come here. You'll find, in, when we can gather a lot of us, you'll find that you're surrounded by sinners. Chief, right here. You say you have no sin? Ah, you better look for another church. John says, you're a liar. Everyone is a sinner. Saved by grace, yes. Working through the power of the Holy Spirit to do what God has asked us to do, yes. Day by day, step by step. I come through the door as a sinner, but I do not expect to stay that way. And neither should you. I should be expected to change, to metamorphose, to change from the inside to the out. From the worm to the butterfly. For this earth, I'm a worm. One day, I'll be a butterfly. Big giant one. No <laughs> many wings. But a good color. Probably camouflage. You know, the perfect color. They will not only gather around themselves preachers and teachers who proclaim what they want to hear. You know what you need to gather around yourself? A preacher who preaches the truth of God who may tell you what you don't want to hear. Who might tell you that, no, that's a sin. Abortion's a sin. Homosexuality is a sin. 
Just like lying is a sin. Stealing is a sin. Murder is a sin. Gossip is a sin. Idolatry is a sin. The Bible's real clear on all of this. So for a culture to say, oh, it's okay? No, it's not okay. And sometimes we need to hear, you know what? That's a sin. Because sometimes people don't know that. They go, really? But it's legal. It might be legal in this state. It's not legal in the kingdom. And that's what we need to live for. But nevertheless, they will turn their ears from truth and turn aside to myths. Paul gives these instructions because it's possible to be deluded and then to leave the sound teaching of Scripture and turn to the falsehood that is so prevalent in the world today. And you are just immersed in it. Just immersed in it. There is no one in our culture today who is involved with the culture at all that is not immersed in delusion and deception, including us. The difference? We have a way of getting clean. We have a way of coming to truth. When they leave sound teaching of Scripture, they turn to something else. You don't just leave something and then just be standing there. You always turn to something else. It's not like you're not going to turn to something else. Because you do. How does the Christ follower make sure they are not deluded? How do you know if you are being deluded? I'm going to give you some answers to that through the scriptures. First, we're going to seek wisdom from God. Turn down uh, the road from uh, 2 Timothy to James. James chapter 1. A lot of people like to skip over the first few verses of James 1 because it sounds a little unreasonable to consider it joy when you encounter various trials. But those trials test your faith. The trials we're in today test the faith of a Christ follower. They certainly do, no doubt. The trials we face today test the quality and the faithfulness of the church. They test that. And if you pass that, you develop endurance. God says that endurance will result you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So I have to have trials so that I can show or demonstrate my faith. But look at verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let that, for let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The one who doubts, I doubt will survive the plague. You will. You just will. You mean, nobody's going to die from the plague? Maybe somebody will. It's kind of a severe thing. Some people die from it. Dying on this planet's not the issue, and you've heard me speak of that many times in the last months. That's not the issue. I'm told I will never die. Amen? Amen. And that is the truth. Never. You say, well, you can go out here and get killed by a car. Yes, I could. You could freeze to death in the duck blind. <laughs> Suppose I could. Okay? However, that's not death for me. That's just a gateway to life, life eternal. It's just a gateway. If I doubt, I doubt God's word, I doubt his promises, I doubt his faithfulness, then I'm like the one tossed in the surf, back and forth. I pray that you get on a boat someday that's tossed to and fro. Wonderful experience. Amazing experience. Especially in the ocean. Wow, those are great experiences. They call it sea legs. You know, if you've just been tramping around on flat ground for several months, and this even I this happens to me, and you get in a boat, you you kind of like, it's almost like sand in the boat just throws you out. You think, well, how did I get thrown out of that? Well, you don't have your sea legs. 
you got tossed to and fro. When I was in Alaska, I got tossed to and fro by 20-foot seas, which means if you're standing on the ground, the sea top is up 20 feet higher than the ceiling. That's a big wave. I didn't like it. I was petrified. And the thing that aggravated me the most during the whole ordeal, there was nothing to hang on to. You'd think they'd put handles inside of boat cabins that you could hang on to them to keep you from getting thrown from one side to the other. See, that's tossed about. You have no control. You can anticipate it. But still, even when it comes upon you, man, hold on. You see, the double-minded man, it means actually the two-spirited man, the man with two minds, one in the world and one in God, one that's covered with flesh, the other covered with spirit, the double-minded man, he's unstable. He's tossed about by every wind, and it's really every wind of doctrine, every wind of change, everything that comes along. How much has our culture been tossed to and fro like a giant sea wave by the plague. Wow. What an amazing ride we've been in. And you think, oh, calm seas. Nope, rogue wave. But yet, do you maintain a steadfast course? See, some people scream and panic. I understand the panic part. The screaming part I've never understood. Plague is coming upon you, disaster, bomb, fire, earthquake, and people scream. I know it's probably just the release of nervous tension, but it doesn't accomplish anything. Maybe it makes you feel a little better. Prayer, on the other hand, always works. If I feel myself being tossed to and fro, perhaps I ought to get on my knees. Maybe it's a more stable platform anyway. And then pray. One who doubts is to be tossed about. To have their mind shifted from one to another. From the world to God. From God to the world. Back and forth. You can become double-minded or two-spirited. The spirit of the world and the spirit of God. Now James goes on in this same chapter to explain that you need to listen and then do something. Do something. Look at verse 22. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror And once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. The pattern of speech which is intended to sway us, this persuasive argument that Paul Paul is speaking about, is designed to sway your views or your thoughts always toward the world, never to God. That's the speech of the world, always to the world. The world will never guide you to God. The Holy Spirit will guide you to God. But James seems seems to think that a Christ follower can change his character and become a Christian with a stable, growing faith. He says, first, you need to hear. You need to hear. Countless people over the centuries, in countless countries, have tried to silence the voice of truth in the church, through the church, the Christ followers. Hundreds and hundreds have been silenced. Literally been killed. Because they spoke and shared the truth. Some are hearers. They like hearing stuff. They don't do anything about it. Some are doers. I love doers. However, some of them are out doing And they haven't heard anything. They're just out doing. What are you doing? I don't know. Stuff. Something. Ah, perhaps we could listen to what God says and then do that. We ain't got time to hear from God. We gotta be busy. Fight, go forth, move. Ah. 
Where are you fighting? Where are you going? What are you moving to? Where is that? In the military, we call those people that just go, 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 go. All thrust and no vector. What that means is, whoosh, off they go. But they don't know where they're going. There's no direction. There's no compass point. Sometimes in the church it gets that way, especially during difficult times. Let's do this, let's do this. Excuse me. Where are we going? What is the direction God has led us in? Is this God's plan? Is this God's direction? And we pray it is. And if it is, and it's been determined to be that way, through the Holy Spirit, go! Go with authority. Go with power. Go with God's blessing and grace. James says, prove that. Test that. James commands us to not only test it, but in our minds to validate it. Certainly to show that we're not just hearers. Do we forget what kind of people we are? How many of you looked at a mirror and then turned away and go, what was that? And you turn back toward the mirror. Because you saw a glimpse of something you didn't like. Or that caught your attention. Or someone, you ever go up to somebody and go, what's that? On your face. And they go, what? Oh man, that's bad. This is a great game. Play with your kids all the time. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, that looks bad. What oh, looks so bad? <clears throat> that frown you're wearing. <laughs> that anger you're showing right now. See, can you see that? Ah, that deception that's in your mind. I can see that on your face. Do you look in a mirror? But look deeply. What do you see? Do you see a man or woman of godly design, of godly character? A person whose faith is stable? In our series of Raising Godly Men on Thursday nights, we've been working our way through the things that stabilize our faith as a godly man. They're called disciplines. These things must be practiced to stabilize not only our faith, but our growth in Christ. And so we're practicing them. And in fact, in Colossians 2.5, Paul uses that text when he says he rejoices in their good discipline. They're good discipline. Disciplines of the faith. The faithful fight against the delusion and per persuasive arguments with good discipline. One author writes, These practices allow us to relinquish something in order to gain something new. We abstain from busyness in ministry, family life, and work. And so the first set is called Disciplines of Letting Go. I release something. And there's seven of them. And so I'll give them to you. I'm not going to explain all of them. For you men, come Thursday night, we're going through them. Solitude. Spending time alone with God. You know, there's so few Christians that practice that. The discipline of silence. Removing noisy distractions to hear from God. That may even be more difficult. Some people can't go without hearing something. In fact, total silence makes them feel uneasy. Fasting. Or we should mention fasting after Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Skipping a meal or meals to find greater nourishment from God. Frugality. Learning to live with less money and still meet your basic needs. Chastity. Abstaining from intimate pleasures for a period of time. Secrecy. Avoiding self-promotion. Practicing serving God without others knowing it. And then seventh, sacrifice. Giving of our resources beyond what seems reasonable to remind us of our dependence on Christ. Solitude, silence, fasting, frugality, chastity, secrecy, sacrifice. Now, depending on who you read... They may or may not list all of these disciplines. I understand that. But I'm just giving them to you from one source. Then there are to contradict, not contradict, to support the disciplines of letting go, 
There's the disciplines of activity. If you're a busy little person, you'll love these. The disciplines of abstinence must be counterbalanced and supplemented by disciplines of engagement or activity. It's choosing to participate in activities that nurture our souls and strengthen us for the race ahead. In other words, it gives you stability in your faith and it gives you direction in your life. The first one, and there are six of these, study. This is not just reading the Bible, it is studying. Time spent reading the scriptures, meditating on its meaning, looking up its meaning, has great importance in our lives. So study. Worship. Number two, offering praise and adoration to God. And I don't mean just coming to a church building. I mean every day, an attitude of worship to God. That's a discipline. We have to work on that. Prayer. Thirdly, talking to and listening to God about our relationship with Him, about the concern of others. Talk to God. Pray. What a difficult discipline. Discipline forth of fellowship, mutually caring in ministry of the body of Christ. Do we care whether we meet or not? Whether we call somebody, encourage somebody, talk to somebody? Fellowship. Fifth, confession. Regularly confess your sins to the Lord and other trusted prayer partners. Regularly. Confession. And then sixth, submission. That's what we're working on this week. Submission. Humbling yourself before God and others while seeking accountability in your relationships. Yielding to. It's a discipline. Now, there's 13 disciplines. Peter, as, and we just started this this morning. Next week, you're going to get, if you come to the Sunday morning study, you're going to get definitions of all of these. But Peter adds other requirements to the 13 disciplines I've mentioned. He adds, by my count, eight more. Turn to 2 Peter. If you're in James, just turn to the right just a tiny bit. 2 Peter. For those of you that were in our study this morning, there it is. Chapter 1, verse 5. And this is a process of stacking. Upon the foundation of Christianity, we stack all of these other disciplines, I'm going to call them. And the first one we're going to see in verse 5 of 2 Peter 1, applying all diligence. I listed diligence as a discipline. Diligence, sticking to it. In what? Your faith. Supply moral, and then I put excellence. Moral excellence, number two. In that moral excellence, knowledge. Knowledge is not just knowing stuff, as you are well aware. It is biblical knowledge. Next, in verse 6, we add self-control. Like we all did Thursday during Thanksgiving. <laughs> self-control. I operated self-control. I couldn't put one more piece of pie in my mouth. <laughs> no. I don't think that's what he's talking about. <laughs> To that we add perseverance, hanging in there, steadfast, staying there. To that we add godliness. To godliness we add brotherly kindness. And number eight, we add love. Biblical agape love. If these qualities, look at verse 8, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Peter's talking about. That's what Paul's talking about. The true knowledge of Christ. If these qualities are yours, which means if they're not yours, you are useless. You are unfruitful. In the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, that. No, I don't like that. I don't either. That's why we practice those. Now Paul adds it even further. He adds another eight to this list. You're going, okay, 13, 8, okay, 16, 29 of these things. I really worked to try to get a 30th one there. But I had to stay within scriptures. Philippians. 
Back to the left, not too terrible far. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Paul's going to give eight more things we should work with. Finally, brethren, and here they are. Add to your list of disciplines, attributes. First, truth. Whatever is true. Next, honorable. Next, what's right. Next, what's pure. Next, what's lovely. Next, whatever is of good repute. The next, excellence. The next, praise. So just add those eight. Paul says, let your mind dwell on these things. Now I want to pause there for just a second. And I know our time's running out. If you just worked on one of those lists, you'd be busy the rest of your life. But God says, work on them all. Go to those scriptures, write them down, and then work on those. But Paul says, let your mind dwell on these things. Dwell, abide, live on these things. Why do we have chaos and delusion and deception? Because our mind is not dwelling on the things of God. We're dwelling on the things of the world. And when we do that, we are worthless. We are unfruitful. These things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Look, practice these things. Practice. I really enjoyed the music this morning. I don't imagine that was the first time any of the artists that were up here played those songs. They said, oh, here's a guitar. Let's play it this morning. I'm assuming there was some practice that went into learning how to play it. Even how to sing. You see, that's what practice does. I don't know whether it's true, and I don't know who said it, but they said if you want to become an expert in something, practice it correctly 10,000 times. And you will be an expert. And I thought, you know, that sounds reasonable. Ever practice a song once? I love the ladies today. Thank you for that. And I know how hard they practiced for the weeks before this day. They didn't just come make that stuff up. They practiced together to give glory, to adore Him. Wow, well, I love that. Practice these things and the God of peace shall be with you. Do you want the God of peace to be with you? Then practice these things. Because the stability of our faith depends on it. To stable our faith. And I must move quickly. We're back in Colossians chapter 2. A steadfast faith. It says, as you therefore, verse 6, have received Jesus Christ as Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Again, gratitude. Why? Because I'm firmly rooted. Gratitude that I'm being built up. Gratitude that my faith is established or set or steadfast. The Christ follower, one who has received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they walk in Him, they practice His commands to be firmly rooted, being built up. And I close with Psalm 1, the Old Testament. Just go back there for just a second. Many of you even have parts of this memorized. Psalm 1. What a great psalm. I'll find it here in a second. There we go. Verse 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. And I might pause there for just a second. 
how blessed, how much favor do we have from God if we do not walk in the persuasive arguments of the world. If we do not walk in the counsel of the wicked, those who are opposed to God, nor stand in the path of sinners. I don't walk, I don't stand, and I don't sit with them. Because I'm not of them. But look at verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law he meditates day and night. Day and night. Do you meditate on the law of God day and night? Do you roll it around in your brain? Do you look at it? You said, well, it's been some days since I actually read the word. And I actually didn't meditate on it at all. I just read it because that was a requirement so I could check the block having read it. Meditate. Roll around in it. Roll it around in your brain. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither and in whatever he does he prospers. This then is the Christ follower that has a stable faith. The steadfastness of our faith should come out in an overflowing of gratitude. The reason? I'm firmly rooted. It's the power and the enablement of the Holy Spirit who convicts me, guides me into all truth. Who My roots grow deep every day. I meditate on God's Word and I love that. Every day I think about it. He builds me up then. The tree of faith is strengthened and built by God so that it becomes firm, steadfast and set, immovable. This is a tree that produces fruit. If it's not, if it's not firmly planted, it's doubtful, it's tossed to and fro, it does not produce fruit. James says it's worthless. The leaves of faith do not wither and shrink back. They flourish even in the most difficult times. The church, this church, the people in the church will prosper, will prosper if they follow the guidelines that God has laid out. And we've only covered 29 of them today. <laughs> Just a tiny bit of the list. I pray God's blessing upon our country, upon our state, upon our city, upon our community. And I pray God would have his will in his way. And I know you do the same. Look at your prayer list then in light of that. Several people are counting on you to lift them up before the Lord today and this week. And so pray for them. Encourage them. It might actually mean that you call them or send them a card of encouragement that you're praying for them. It is so nice to hear someone say, I'm praying for you.